Midras, in the middle of the Shvela, of the lowlands. It's beautiful around here. There are kids here on Tiul in school. Uh, it, it doesn't feel at all like the stories that I'm going to be telling you. But this area was the heart of the Bar Kokhba revolt. Now, we read Akina, uh, that we have a very similar one on Yom Kippur. And I'm just going to read you the first few lines. Arzea Levanon Adirei HaTorah Ba'alei Trisim B'Mishna U'Bigmara Giborei Koach Amalea V'Tahara Damam Nishpach V'Nishta Gvura Hinam Kedoshei Harugei Malchut Asara Val Eile Ani Bochia V'Eni Nigara this kina is talking about the 10 martyrs, the Asara Harugei Malchut. And we remember that we have a similar kina, Ela Eskara, that we say on Yom Kippur. What is this story and why is it so significant that we have two keynotes that address it? The story historically doesn't work so well. We list all different Tanaim who don't all die exactly at the same time. However, the larger picture is the time period of the Gzerot Hashmad, of the decrees of the Romans against the Jews, and of the end of an entire era, an entire generation of rabbinic leadership. And because that is so devastating, we have two keynote that talk about it. And this is a good place to explore what was the Bar Kokhba revolt and what was the aftermath? Why is this kina describing such a sense of devastation? We are in the Jewish town of Midras. This whole area of the Shvela, of the lowlands of Judah, was full of Jewish communities. First temple times, second temple times. This is a very fertile area and lots of people lived here. Now, what happens is that around the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt, they start to realize that they're gonna be rebelling against Rome. The Roman army is much stronger than them and there's no way that they can survive in a frontal battle. So what do all of these communities do, and we found more than 300 of these complexes so far, not only in Yehuda, but in other areas, they take the areas that had already been underground installations, like cisterns, like mikvaot, just caves underground, and they turn them into hideout caves. Now, where we are, you can look down, we are right by where there was a water cistern, and there's even the remains of a mikvah below us. Hey, uh, this beautiful tree that we're standing under is this beautiful fig tree. Figs love water. So if you ever see a really, really vibrant fig tree, that's telling you there's some water source nearby. And that's what there is here. So the Jews of these communities, they took these areas and they turned them into hideout caves. And we are right by the entrance to one of these caves, which are very, very narrow. We're not gonna crawl through. The camera is not gonna survive it. Right? But these are very, very narrow caves. And we hear about them, by the way, all over the place. The Gemara talks about hiding out in these caves. Roman historians like Dio Cassius talk about the Jews hiding out in these caves. We even hear about halachic dilemmas about what's happening in the caves. And can you wear your shoe backwards because that might confuse people. So these caves are very much connected to the Bar Kokhba story. What does that have to do with Arkina? For that, we're gonna go down a little bit further. Despite the widespread support for Bar Kokhba, and we know that because we find these cave complexes all over the place, inside existing towns, all around. Despite this widespread support, the Bar Kokhba revolt was a terrible, terrible disaster. Many, many people are massacred, and the greatest leaders of the generation, especially Rabbi Akiva, are killed. And we hear about that in Arkina. Right, Rabbi Akiva, the Gemara genius. Right, referring to that famous Gemara in Brachot, the terrible Gemara, where Rabbi Akiva is being tortured, and he says Shema. 
And his students say to him, how can you say Shema? He says, because I want to fulfill bechol nafshecha, afilu notel at nafshecha, even if I'm going to be killed. And Rabbi Akiva is killed. And this kina goes on and describes the others who are killed, Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba, Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion, perhaps not historically accurate how they're all put together in the kina to, at the same time, but it makes the point that an entire generation of leadership is cut down. Now, the next person after Rabbi Akiva is Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba. And he He's mentioned to us in the Gemara as somebody who salvages the situation. How does he do that? The Romans forbid rabbinic ordination. They forbid smicha. Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba sacrifices himself so that he can give smicha to five members, uh, young students, including Rabbi Meir, including Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Yossi, who are going to become the next generation of Torah leadership. But it's a very difficult path to follow. They are coming along after everybody has been killed. And this kina is reflecting that sense of terror and despair. The greatest are being killed. Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion, who's also mentioned in the Kina here, wrapped in a Torah scroll and set on fire. And when his students say to him, what do you see? What do you see, Rabbi? He says, Gvilin nisrafim, the parchment is being burnt. The otiot porchot, and the letters are flying away into the air. And that's exactly what's happening. This next generation of leadership. Rabbi Meir and Buria. Buria is Rabbi Hanina's daughter. Hey, um, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and the other teachers become the flying letters. They have to carry on. They have to bring the words of Torah to the next generation. And therefore, even though everything we see here is destroyed, Jewish settlement in the land of Yehuda is finished. They move to the Galil. And yet, and yet, the Sanhedrin continues, Smicha continues, and there is hope for the next generation.